I want to thank everybody for joining us for today's session entitled Putting in Place the Foundations for Successful Digital Transformation. Uh, today's session is presented by Digital Lab Consulting and is part of the Asterix Technology Group uh, webcast and kind of educational series that we've been putting on for, we're actually going on about a one year anniversary right now. So we've been bringing together thought leaders from uh, throughout the lab technology sector globally. Um, and we are thrilled to continue this session and we're thrilled to have a great speaker with us today. We can go to the next slide, please. Before I turn it over to our speaker, if you're not familiar with Asterix or the work that we're doing or why we're hosting sessions like this, a couple of quick uh, bullet points to take away. Uh, we successfully deliver highly specialized services, process technology, uh, as well as outsource services to fundamentally transform how science-based businesses operate. Uh, we do this all in an effort to improve scientific outcomes in the lives of people everywhere. And Asterix, just as a little bit of background information, we've been around since 1995. We're privately held. Uh, we came out of an IT division of a company called APBI, uh, which was a life science research organization. We operate from seven offices in the United States and one in beautiful Costa Rica, and headquarters are up in Red Bank, New Jersey. We're a market leader in dedicated digital transformation services and expert outsourced services for the scientific community. And the type of companies that we help could be anything from you know, a Fortune 1000 life science enterprise to chemical and CPG companies, government research institutions, a lot of times these are organizations that have very fast um, growing IT and compliance needs. Let me go to the next slide, please. So before I turn it over real quick, the services that I've talked about, you know, what they mean, they span the complete life cycle of scientific data systems. And that means in the beginning, you know, when we do what's called business process analysis or enterprise architecture, we're typically helping companies understand at a very root level, what is their technology stack what should it look like, you know, based on what they're doing as a business or where they're going as a business. From there, we can help them select the right vendors um, to come in and <clears throat> make up that technology stack. We can help with development and implementation. And then after that, we can help with computer systems validation. You know, those are services that are well within our wheelhouse. And then we can even provide service support, training, upgrades, et cetera, all through our 360 uh, digital services. And then we can even provide staffing services. So if you need technical staffing, if you need scientific staffing, uh, Asterix is a great uh, resource for that as well. And then we can go to the next slide, please. So that's enough about Asterix. Let me take a minute and introduce uh, our speaker today, Dr. Elliot Randall. Uh, he's managing partner and co-founder of Digital Lab Consulting, an independent strategic and business consulting company. Very passionate about helping organizations to transform their business through better use of technology. And he brings over 25 years of experience in the biopharmaceutical industry uh, across the entire value chain. Everything from R&D, manufacturing, uh, through clinical. He brings uh, a BS in biochemistry, a PhD in molecular biology uh, from the University of Manchester, UK, and an MBA from Warwick Business School in the UK, which means he's a heck of a lot smarter than I, and I want to turn it over and let Elliot take it from here. Thanks, Elliot. I'll come back on at the end. Thanks very much for the, the kind introduction there, Kevin. Um, so, yeah, hello, everyone. Thank you for, for joining the webinar. Um, clearly, it was part of the title was Digital Transformation, and, and that's obviously a topic that, that attracts a, a lot of information, a lot of attention at the moment. And just on the screen, it's a it's a headline from a few years ago, but it's the sort of thing you see on an almost daily basis. So in this particular example, McKinsey um, stating that they believe that digital technologies will deliver billions of dollars of value across industry over the next decade. So we're, we're already probably halfway through that decade, given given the timing of that quote. But you know, it's just an example of, of the kind of statement you'll see. Yeah, almost every day in every newspaper in every industry um, publication as well. So th th there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of interest in this topic, um, but there's also some really common expectations of what digital transformation can do for a business. So for example, again, a few examples on the screen there, but things like increased productivity or increased capacity, improving the quality of data, enabling the reuse of data, improved visibility of information and also getting better insights into what's going on in the business and what's going on in the wider environment as well and i suppose last but not least um, on there we've got the foundation for ai and you know artificially intelligence ai 
is again another hot topic not just in the industry but uh, but beyond and it's actually one of the most common topic topics that i see raised during conversations about digital transformation so you know we, we want to do ai we want to take our business forward using ai so when one of our clients mentions that to me my usual question is so so what do you actually want to achieve with ai and the most common response to that is that somewhere one somewhere in the organization went to a conference or read about it in a newspaper and they want to do it too so understanding what that use case is for ai is, is often um, a, a tricky conversation it's one that people often haven't actually thought about too much so it's obviously great to see a lot of interest in using technology to ultimately deliver better outcomes for patients for example but all that excitement's got to be tempered with reality too so uh, as an example it's often a high site as a high profile example um, IBM launched Watson Health quite some years ago now with a fanfare of being able to or the goal of being able to cure cancer and of course the goal of that the sentiment of that is is fantastic but you probably also may have seen at news earlier this year that IBM are looking to sell Watson Health because that challenge seemed a lot greater than they uh, they were perhaps anticipating so as it turns out collecting integrating and getting insight from data is not as easy as it first seems and you know people talk about artificial intelligence as the panacea to to all ills but um, you know the old adage of garbage in garbage out when it comes to data doesn't miraculously get disappear and go away because of AI just like any other computational technique new or otherwise the only way to generate accurate and reliable results from things like AI and machine learning is to start with high quality unambiguous data in the first place there's no really getting around that fact but though data with those kind of qualities you know clean unambiguous data can be really hard to come by you're really probably all really familiar with a quote of something like this data scientists spending most of their time as, as what here is called data janitors so finding um, pu pulling together cleaning harmonizing reformatting data and very little of it actually pulling uh, getting insights and analyzing that data as well so essentially the, the message being that data scientists and probably scientists more generally spend far too much of their time on data wrangling compared to actually gathering and gaining insights from the data that they're working with so to to try and illustrate that point and appreciate i'm talking you know this this presentation is entitled the foundations for digital transformation i'm going to focus quite a lot on data but we'll also touch on the importance of process and people and how those things th things interact as well but you know we'll, we'll use data as the common thread through this this uh, this presentation so to, to illustrate the point around data quality here's an example that was posted on LinkedIn I think it was last year sometime now um, actually by one of Google's chief decision scientists and I think it really illustrates the problem it, it's not a pharmaceutical problem or even an R&D problem at all but I'm sure you've come across really similar problems in your own business so essentially it represents just a, it's even a subset of the many different terms that people entered into a database or into a data set when they were trying to say the, the town or, or, or the um, or the city Philadelphia so when somebody was trying to aggregate this data from various different data sources these are the different options they found and some of them are clearly abbreviations some of them are misspellings some of them are just alternatives of the same thing and of course if you are a data scientist you could probably generate business rules in a data science pipeline to cope with this so simple things like wildcards and that might be okay if your business is based solely in Philadelphia if you're only dealing with people based in Philadelphia but if not you'd most have to have similar lists or you'd come across similar lists um, for every single city in a state or a country or even globally so trying to clean this data or design algorithms to cope with the ambiguity of this data is a huge amount of work and probably addressing it at the outset and having clean data that's from the point of data capture is probably a better way to go about trying to address this problem <clears throat> 
So in a, in a similar vein, again, some, some quotes, some statements on the screen there, they're just some of the things you'll see quite often about the negative impact of bad data quality on a business. So they're about data quality more generally, including things like inaccurate data and, and certainly go beyond the pharma industry. But they also il illustrate that data quality can have an enormous cost to the business beyond the time that I illustrated earlier that is spent by data scientists. So while the problems of poor data quality and dirty data can start to be addressed through data cleaning, that retrospective approach is extremely time consuming and costly. It's far better to take a proactive approach to the data quality, which is where things like data harmonization can help. So why do I say harmonization and perhaps not standardization? Well, I suppose that's out of recognition of two main things. Firstly, because absolute standardization can take a long time and effort. And second, because in some cases it might not be possible to achieve at all. Or maybe just as an example, if you standardize everything perfectly within your organization and then start working with a new partner or have an acquisition of a company who uses a different approach or a different terminology, then you might have to take a step back. So I think it's worth looking at harmonization and standardization as part of a continuum. Harmonization is more about the degree to which standardization is perhaps both possible and appropriate. And I think it's also important to not to lose fact, uh, excuse me, lose sight of the fact that neither harmonization or standardization of data are actually necessarily a goal in of themselves. They're typically just a means to achieve other goals, whether that's being able to answer complex questions or achieving automation or, or something else. So the degree to which you need to standardize your data is often dependent on what you're actually trying to do with it, what you're trying to actually achieve. I think it's also important to highlight that harmonization benefits from the existence of data standards. So they help organizations actually harmonize to or towards something. So maybe these team, teams, terms get used a little bit interchangeably, but it, I think it's often important to understand whether absolute harmonization is, is or absolute standardization is actually the goal you're actually trying to get to. Now, I think we can probably all agree that the pharmaceutical industry have been, been fairly slow to adopt standards compared to other industries. If we look at other industries that we all rely on in our daily lives, you know, take, take work out of the equation for a moment, but things like telecoms, banking, and perhaps even the music industry, all of those have adopted standard ways of transferring information, including file formats and connectivity standards. So music, things like MP, MP3, GPS for stat, sat navs and, and so on and so forth. And I would say that every single one of those standards have something in common. They're all designed ultimately to make things more efficient or in some cases just make things work at all. So if you, if you can imagine trying to use a credit card to pay for goods, if the process and data that you had to enter wasn't standardized, if you're having to use a different method of payment every single time you went to a different store. So essentially, the standards in these industries are there to make life simpler and increase the reliability and the effectiveness of many of the goods and services, services that we use every single day. Okay, so you know if that's not actually a perfect situation, if any of you travel a lot, or at least if you used to, then you've probably had to carry several different plug adapters or a bulky multi-adapter with you when you travel to different countries. So that actually reflects something else as well. In all walks of life, when things just work, you rarely think that's because some effort has already gone into harmonization or standardization, but you really notice when it hasn't. So it's one of those things, you know, daily life, things going smoothly, often it's because things have been standardized or harmonized in the background and you just don't think about it. So if we think about standards more generally, um, I say we're all used to, whether we think about it or using standards in our daily lives to make things easier, more efficient for us and for others, but that doesn't always translate into the work environment. But with standards in place, um, they can make it easier to create and share and integrate data, 
whether that's combining public data and partner data and purchase data with your own internal data, or whether it's integrating research and clinical trials information with health device data to come overcome, for example, you know, the translational medicine gap. I think they're also, as you see there, one of the points on the screen, they're seen as essential to the successful implementation of things like fair data standards and data integrity as well. And they're also an important point. In fact, they're pretty foundational when it comes to things like AI and machine learning initiatives. In fact, you know, the, the lack of gold standard training data is often cited as a problem that exists, again, beyond, beyond this industry, uh, but when you're trying to exploit AI at all. So when information used to train an algorithm for AI, for example, is limited, it eventually creates bias in the AI output and standards can form a you know standards when they're in the form of something like scientific ontologies can help AI models understand the science behind it so that gives a much better chance of your AI model or machine learning model being able to uh, give you know, effective analysis and give more effective results So standards can define both the format as well as the meaning of data, but also how things are done. So here I've, on this slide here, I've tried to highlight three of the main types of standard. This isn't necessarily exhaustive, but just to try and categorize what I mean by, by these different standards. And as you'll see as we go through over the coming minutes, um, these three things can be somewhat interlinked. Firstly, there's nomenclature standards. So these ensure the use of consistent terminology and they can also define relationships between things. Process standards harmonize the way we do things and improve the reproducibility of both the process itself and also the data it generates. And then you have data exchange. Standards. So they provide a standard way of capturing and transferring information, which for the purpose of this meeting, um, including both file format standards and connectivity standards as well. So if we think about nomenclature standards first, perhaps. So on the screen there, there's several types of nomenclature, excuse me, nomenclature standards, which we can broadly, I think, group into two or three different areas. So firstly, there's there's things like internal naming conventions or lists. So within your own organization, that might be lists of project names, sample IDs, compound IDs, that, those kind of things. They're, they're probably proprietary to your organization. But then you have things like ontologies. So things like the allotrope ontology, the NCI thesaurus, and those typically define relationships as well. So they're not just about a term in, in its own standalone capacity within a list, but actually the relationships between those terms. And then you have things like ISO standards. So you know, IDMP would be an example here. So um, identification of, uh, and description of med medicinal products is IDMP stands for, if you're not familiar with it, but also probably things more generally as well that uh, you'll see in ISO standards, which can be um, standard lists of country names. So that can be useful for, for harmonizing data or standardizing data or that part of the data for a, for a clinical trial site, for example. So you know, if we think about how lists or nomenclature lists are often used today, um, depending on which part of the business you're from, you've probably already got pick lists in whatever system you use, you know, drop down menus and the like. So you know, if we use ELN and LIMS and ERP perhaps as an example, um, they usually use pick lists to try and standardize some of the nomenclature. But the typical status quo that you see is that those are in locally managed lists that are separate and unique to the application, the individual application. So some companies have multiple LIMS or multiple ELNs, and often those the terminology that's used by the two of those is not necessarily connected or not necessarily harmonized between them and i think if you look around your organizations i think there's growing use of things like public and external and ontologies but you know not every 
typically don't pervade every part of the organization or at least at least not today and that situation often means that the reference data that each system has to use is manually updated in each and every system there's no easy mechanism to ensure use of a common common terminology and ultimately what that means is that it's really hard to connect the data between those different systems for analysis so if you're trying to link data in your ERP to your limbs um, there's often some sort of data mapping or data uh, translation often with a manual step in between to achieve it so you know trying to add a bit more flesh to that one this this image is somewhat of an oversimplification um, you know having three different systems having different names for ultimately the same thing so the, the reality for most companies is that the different names are actually used for the same thing in the same system, not just across different system. So if you, if you take this example, then, you know, the same protein being referred to within three different systems by three different names. If, if you're an expert in this area, if you're an expert on this specific protein, the expert might recognize that they're the same thing most other people probably wouldn't and a computer would certainly struggle to know that they're the same thing too so of course you could map the terms to one another they're maybe synonyms of the same thing um, that goes again more widely so if one system calls something a batch and another one calls it a lot but they both use the same number then, then again that's a, a relatively straightforward mapping between the two things but if you've got different system calling the same assay or, or test a different thing in different systems it's the same thing that le level of mapping becomes really time consuming because you have to do it at the level of every single assay in your lists so having people use consistent nomenclature across systems in the first place reduces the amount of mapping that needs to be done so i see things like data harmonization and data mapping as somewhat complementary rather than mutually exclusive approaches. So increasingly, uh, my colleagues and I see companies taking the approach of trying to centralize their reference data so that it's used consistently. In, in some cases, they use dedicated systems that have the ability to serve reference data or list to systems used by the scientists or by the wider business. And that type of approach starts to address the sort of problems that we were mentioning earlier. You know, there becomes a single source of truth for all your reference data, certainly all your scientific reference data. It gives the ability for you to start um, leveraging things like external ontologies and as well as inter internally defined lists managed centrally. It gives the possibility that you are using or emphasizes the fact that you can use the same terminology in different systems and most certainly most importantly enables that cross-linking of data and searching of related data by things like data science pipelines um, across all your different systems regardless if those are integrated in any other way so getting to that point though obviously requires a lot of groundwork and, and some of the key steps to get there, um, somewhat of a journey to go from a current state to one where you have centrally managed and common nomenclature. But often there are several key steps like, like are those outlined on the screen here. So typically you go through a process of trying to understand what the key entities of your organization are, whether that's things like sample or results or equipment and their, their attributes. And try to understand um, what attributes are in the most need of harmonization of standardization and then understand the best route to try and standardize those so it could be things like a permitted value list or a naming convention or even things like a type and format a, um, you know date format or something like that um, importantly i think it's also important to align that and if possible try and not start with your own lists internally but see if there are external lists that or somebody's already done the work for you um, so try and understand whether there's something that can give you a head start in this area you don't you don't have to reinvent the wheel if we think about the other types of standards uh, so we've said nomenclature standards and next one i'll cover a little bit is the process standards and as i mentioned earlier 
process standards, the real goal of those is to help define how something is or, or at least should be done. And process standards, I think you know, the reason for pro, uh, standard processes is, as I mentioned earlier, to try and improve data re reproducibility and to try and achieve a repeatable, harmonized, agreed, and importantly, documented way of doing something. So the most familiar example to most people, or most people who work in a lab, might be a standard operating procedure or an SOP. But there's also things that you might come across as you move more into manufacturing, things like S88 for batch processing, or in the clinical area, there's the C dash for clinical study data collection. But I think in broad terms, all of those can be thought of as recipes, and the goal of which is to try and improve reproducibility, but also to aid transfer of a process from one person to another, or from one site to another, and also to help fa uh, facilitate technology transfer, for example, to and from a, a CDMO, for example. So having harmonized standards is also at the heart of any transformation project to introduce automation. If your process isn't clearly and un unambiguously described, similar to what I described with nomenclature earlier, it's really challenging to automate a process that is, is not standardized. So if, if we, again, I'll draw the example of manufacturing area. Many manufacturing organizations have adopted things like manufacturing execution systems or MES as a way of trying to streamline their processes. In, inherently, those systems, MES systems, are driven by a, a set of instructions guiding the production process. So what I referred to earlier as, as a recipe approach makes a lot of sense. But if you move back into R&D, while people are used to using SOPs, there's typically a perception that, that being driven by a recipe in some degree is somehow restricting the flexibility that you might need in research. So it's not suitable for research and development activities. Yet when you step back and think about it, most industries are increasingly adopting high throughput and automation technologies. So of course, these type of technologies, any robotics or, or high throughput instrumentation needs to be effectively programmed. And a program, of course, is a kind of process recipe. So the more people use these technologies and are ad adopting methodologies in their R&D work as well, things like design of experiment as, as they're doing that to um, help limit the design space for, for their exploration or for their optimization work, the more they're adopting automation and things like DOE earlier in the R&D process, the more they're actually using process standards. So probably you could all start to consider things like the adoption of robotics and excuse me, automation as a way of introducing process standards by, by stealth effectively. You know, it's happening, but people aren't necessarily thinking about it. So last but not least of the, the three items on my, on my pie chart, uh, we have file format standards. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, I think that's not just the file formats, but the transfer mechanisms as well. And if we think in terms of file formats, I, I would say that that's the area that's led to the most heated debates and challenges over the years. Um, it's where there's been historically probably a lot less alignment and particularly around things like instrument formats. So the lack of harmonization in that area has really often led to huge issues in collating data. So if we take analytical characterization of, of, a, of a product, for example. So in the analytical world, characterization of molecules and batch processes, it, it can take a Herculean effort to bring together all the data from the different instruments. And it's actually not even limited to different instrument types, but more often combining data from the same type of instrument from two different vendors is in itself a pretty big challenge. Now, some of you might actually live that, you might uh, be from that part of an organization. So what our format standards are, I they can be, I think, grouped into, into 
several main areas. You, you have generic formats, you know, things again, we, we use outside of work as well, things like XML and uh, HDF5 and things like that. And, and those generic standards, file format standards, are usually the basis for the domain specific ones. People haven't created a, a, you know, a new framework entirely. They've, they've stood on the shoulders of, of the people who have, have used them for a more generic purpose. And then you have things like scientific file formats. I say they might, they might build on things like XML in general. So you have ADF, Animal, UDM, things like that for, for instrument data in the science area. You have scientific um, file formats like that, but you also have often things like clinical file formats. So things like SDTM and SEND for clinical and non-clinical data. And, and of course, beyond that, there's also document standards more broadly, right? So it's you know, the, the documentation standards you have to adhere to for, for the different submissions, for example, to whatever regulatory body is appropriate for, for the industry you're in. Um, and I say, I'm also including connectivity standards in here. So you have instrument connectivity standards, things like CELA, because fundamentally, while they're not about exchanging information between people, there are Fun, at their core about exchanging information, in this case, typically between instruments, between systems. So when, or, excuse me. So, you know, the, coming back to that point about automation, automation is where a process and a connectivity standard starts to come together. So you might use process standards to help automate a unit operation in your organization, but when connectivity standards enable different instruments or different robots to communicate, then you can aut automate the transfer from one unit operation to the next. And you can make really great strides in automating a complete end-to-end -end process. And I think in many cases, things like Allotrope and CDISC, the file format actually also has an accompanying controlled vocabulary. So we have that, that link back to the main literature standards a little bit again. So I think if you if you go beyond individual file formats, I think it's also worth thinking about data sharing more generally. So whether that's internal sharing or external exchange of data between organizations. So for those of you who work with different um, contract organizations, whether that's CROs or, or something, you know, contract production uh, manufacturing organizations, um, when you work with the different ones, you probably receive data back from each one in a totally different format. And while you can try and uh, try and align to a single file format, for example, it can also be overcome in, in other ways. You know, th there are ways to contractually, for example, uh, explicitly state what data is required back from that partner organization and in what format it's needed. So people often don't ex you know, don't think about that. They just accept what data comes back from the organization and think that's their partner's way of working and, and they just live with it. But there are some yeah, non-technological um, ways of trying to harmonize that for, for your business. And I think you know where things like electronic data management and transfer systems aren't in place, either internally or, or indeed with partners, file templates can help, but only if the use of them somehow enforced and they don't become personalized. You know, everybody's got their own version of a, of a, a particular template for capturing testing data, for example. And increasingly, we see companies and organizations providing gui internal guidelines to try and overcome this. Um, those kind of guidelines can dictate various different aspects of data capture, such as use the example of date formats earlier. But the most useful ones also start to provide examples of the best way to actually lay out your data as well. So in the area of exchanging spreadsheets, for example, so spreadsheets being particularly prone to abuse, um, these kind of data capture um, data format, data layout guidelines can be really, really helpful. So for example, there's a there's a really good article by a guy called Hadley Wickham from a few years ago that 
that sets out the principles for what he termed or what he coined tidy data. So basically when it comes down to it, it's it's to provide solid advice for making data in spreadsheets or, or tabular data in general, easier to share, consume and analyze. And I mean that by, by people and by computers. You, know, you, you don't, if you take this sort of tidy data concept, it becomes you know, a good way of starting to look at how um, and educate people as to how these kind of uh, ways of laying out the data to make it easier for for that data to be reused by, by individuals or say computers and you know, by yourself, the people generating it as well. But just because data's tidy, uh, as in that those principles outlined on the previous slide, just because it's tidy doesn't mean it's what we might call clean data, which brings us perhaps back to the importance of nomenclature standards. So if you've got nicely structured tabular data um, and either the column headings are different for the same type of information, or the options available in the pick list are different, or you know the title of that column entirely is different between systems, makes it really hard to realize that it's talking about the same thing, or indeed that, uh, you know, that uh, that data can be brought together. So the, the three areas, nomenclature process and data exchange standards, they're, they're all different types of standards and they're all, in, all important in their own ways. And the concepts can be completely interdependent too. But where, where do you start? Right? So all this is very well, but if you've got a, if you're part of an organization or a group in an organization that doesn't currently have a, a standards initiative or doesn't currently capture information or processes in a standard way, where, where do you start? Um, one of my colleagues highlighted this quote to me, and I think it helps explain one of the issues in adopting standards in the first place. When it comes to standards, there's usually multiple options available which can lead to confusion. So how do you actually select the right one for you? And I think we would always recommend starting with a, a very, very clear use case. So if I can borrow from QBD or quality by design principles, I think it's always really helpful to think of data with the end in mind. So what are you actually going to do with that data once it's created? It aligns somewhat with the um, principles of the FAIR principles. FAIR principles culminate in the, reuse, the reusability part of, of data. Um, so I think it's important to select the standards that best fit where the data will go and how it's likely to be used. So for example, if you know, if you're in the clinical area, you know your data might ultimately end up in a submission to the FDA, or you hope it will, then it makes sense to use the same terminology that is used or standards that are used or required for submission right at the outset of your data capture. And I know you can't plan for every potential use of your data. And in main, many cases, you don't know who will benefit from your data down the line or, or how. So that obviously presents a bit of a challenge, but trying to think of the possible use cases, the most common ways your data is likely to be used by others um, is, a, is an important starting point. But it's also in, important to, again, sort of emphasizing the, the people part of, of standards and digital transformation as a heart. I think many of the, the presentations I've attended, many of the discussions I've been involved in, obviously the people are arguably far more important than the uh, the other aspects of digital transformation. You know, it's about changing the way people benefit from uh, and can you know, contribute better to the business and to, to moving things forward. So we should never forget the people aspect, even if we're you know, focusing this, this discussion on, on, on data. So I think the key thing to recognize when you talk about standardizing processes or, or in this case, standardizing data, I think the value of harmonized or standardized data is often realized by the people, or typically realized by the people who are using that data or consuming it, but the effort to capture well-described and standardized data is mainly on the shoulders of the people who generate the data in the first place. Of course, that can be the same person. Um, in fact, I 
I saw a quote I quite like in, in Nature Index um, kind of a year or so ago from a guy called Lambert Heller. And his quote was something along the lines of, as a scientist, you should treat your data like a love letter to your future self. And I think that's, that's absolutely true. But generally, the problems occur not just when you're trying to decipher your own data, but when data is moving between people, teams, or even companies. So basically, if there's a really large overhead for a scientist in the lab to capture data, so if you're making them have to manually complete lots and lots of different metadata fields or that you're overly constraining them by a recipe, then any attempt whatsoever to harmonize or standardize data, data is going to face a really, really big uphill battle. I think it comes back to the point I, I made uh, a few minutes back. Most of us use standards in our everyday life without even thinking about it. When they're implemented well, people don't notice they're actually using them. I think that's a principle that can be applied in the business workplace as well. So if we look at that, that problem from a, a slightly different perspective, I think in most cases, I don't think people generating data are actually aware of the problems that their way of working, assuming it's not standardized, that their way of working actually causes other people. I mean, nobody goes out their way to make their colleagues have to do, uh, have to work harder on purpose. So often people in the lab are, aren't aware of the steps that data scientists have to go through to get their data in a state that's ready for analysis. So it helps to bring things to life for those people. So for example, if a data scientist can show to their, their colleagues in the lab, the different steps they have to go through to process some of the data they receive, it can it can help make it real for them. You know, it's not just a statistic of somebody spending lots of their time. They can understand why that time's required or what the consequences of their their data transfer mechanism is. It's not all one way either. I think we find in cases where projects have an actively involved data scientist or statistician early in, involved early in the project. They can guide the best way to collect and store data, even if you know, even help the lab scientists do some of the more routine analysis, more in a self-service way themselves. And I think this is also far better for everybody than trying to have to work out what data actually is after receiving uh, it, and you know, resulting in what you typically see as a "Can you just analyse this for me?" email to a data scientist, and the many phone calls or conversations that that ensue afterwards. And, and I think that kind of approach, yeah, where, where the scientists and the data scientists are separate from one another and not closely intertwined in their, their working practices. It reminds me of a quote from the statistician Ronald Fisher. You might know that any of you some sort of basic statistics on your data, you might know Fisher's tests and things like that. But he stated, you know, to consult a statistician after an experiment is finished, it's often me to ask him to conduct a post-mortem examination. Perhaps he can say what the experiment died, died of. I think you can easily substitute the word statistician with data scientist or anybody who's processing data here as well. You know, basically involve them early on and help them to help you. So another thing to consider when you're looking at standards of, of any type, whether they're process nomenclature or, or otherwise, um, a standard is only as good as its governance. So where a standard doesn't already exist internally, I say don't go reinventing the wheel, look for external standards as a good starting point. Um, you know, adopt industry design standards where possible and where practical. They don't, they don't cover everything, but there's a lot out there and there's a lot of very good starting points for you to go with. So that's, I think, one way of, of having governance with the standard if the standard comes with its own governance structure uh, from external standards anyway. But of course, it's important to understand that, you know, when you're looking at external standards, that they actually are widely adopted. Just because lots of companies are a member of a consortium, for example, doesn't mean the resulting standard is actually used actively by those companies. You see that, that quite a lot indeed. Um, so you'll see industry forums, Pistoia Alliance is a good example of those can help get to the bottom of what other similar companies are doing 
and also to help share their experience of what has worked and what hasn't worked. So basically, when it comes to data standards, if you start to engage with these communities, you probably won't be the only one to be looking at different standards. So it's good to use resources like that to, to share experiences. You know, there's, a, there's a wider community out there for, for this. So if I can, can summarize on the, on the topic of standards, then um, I say they're not the only element of digital transformation, but hopefully, we've gone through in the last half hour or so is to understand why they're important why they're an important foundation um, coupled with with changes or harmonization of processes coupled with the people element you know data standards can make people's jobs easier they can make processes easier as well so data data is a you know a key part of the foundation or good data is a key part of the foundation of any digital transformation project so what i would always recommend you know first of all try and work out what's the problem you're trying to solve if you're trying to implement a standard uh, I said earlier the most useful standards are those that try and address a specific use case um, some standards they might overlap and even conflict with each other so it's important to select them carefully clearly and define and manage the scope of each one that you adopt and again you don't have to start from scratch there there are communities out there that can help you with this type of topic and I think more broadly then perhaps standards in scientific research if you've gone back 10-15 years people rarely talked about it they're, they're a bit more prevalent today but they're still at a relatively early stage and they're adopting so they'll continue to develop new ones will appear and I'm sure some will even disappear so it's important again to, to kind of stay engaged um, and be part of the communities that, that produce them and, and people who use them as well. So I'd like to end with highlighting something that I highlight on almost every project that we work on. I think it's important to remember that if you want to transform your business, there's no point trying to replicate what you do today, just doing the same things, but digitally. Ultimately, digital transformation projects benefit from having harmonized nomenclature, processes, and ways of exchanging data. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and interest, and I'm very, very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> we appreciate that, Elliot, and I appreciate a great presentation. I do want to remind uh, folks on the call, if you'd like to ask a question right now, you're welcome to do so. You'll simply type the question in the screen and we will read the question out loud. We won't read your name and we won't read your company uh, to answer it. I want to go ahead and get the recording stopped.